just read. And uh, so I, I put out kind of what I should be reading uh, earlier in the year, and I've had this book recommended to me for a while ago. And so I, I decided uh, to read it. It's called The Warmth of Other Suns, and, and the book is about the great migration of African Americans moving basically to the north in light of kind of Jim Crow and the lack of Reconstruction in the South. And it, it kind of follows basically three different families, primarily three different people uh, from moving from um, Mississippi and uh, Florida up into places like Chicago, New York, and eventually LA. And so you read about these families that aren't forced to move, but due to the circumstances and the lack of opportunity that they had because of Jim Crow and everything going on, and kind of the opportunity in the North as the Industrial Revolution was going on, and you had World War I and World War II, and a lot of uh, uh, what was being made was happening in the North. So in the North, we had this need for a lot of extra laborers and a lot of extra Workers, And so you find these people, they, they moved up here and hoping for uh, more freedom, hoping for more opportunity. And to be honest, they, they, they found some more opportunity. They, they found more freedom, but they also had obstacles like redlining. And it, it, those of you who have grown up in the North, it's like, not like you don't know anybody or hadn't known anybody or maybe not even struggled with racism yourself. And so they in, encountered that. And you read through this book and you get kind of the, to the end of this book. And um, whenever I read about people's lives, whether it be biographies or whatever, I, I'm just kind of really interested on how kind of things turned out. And I noticed pretty much for all of them, I mean, one of them became a doctor and actually became very wealthy. I think the author even at one point uh, said like his, 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 his business was literally like printing money. Like that's how well he eventually was doing out in LA. While at the same time, like you kind of, read about sometimes how their families turned out or kind of what it was like at the end of their life or how their communities uh, ended up turning out. And, and you're kind of disappointed by all of that. And, and when I think about um, life and when I think about the challenges that we all go through and how life ends up kind of playing out, we all deal with different challenges. We all have disappointments. And to be honest, like life can be fairly tragic, uh, can it? Are you glad you came here this morning to, for me to tell you that, right? But it is. Our, our lives, they, they are full of drama. They're full of difficulty. It's full of stress. Our lives are full of suffering, and sometimes that drama, that difficulty, that suffering, sometimes it's caused by other people, sometimes it is caused by us, sometimes it just kind of is the product of living in a broken world. It can be a, a natural disaster or, or just something happens that it just seems to be out of everyone's control. But the truth is, is there's a lot of tragedy in life. And over this past year, COVID has contributed to the tragedy of life. It's just going, bad things are going to happen. Jesus makes this clear, by the way, and I try to make this clear as your pastor, right? This isn't a place that you're going to come to, and I'm just going to tell you how good things are all the time. Right? Sometimes, you know, some churches, I mean, that's their model, right? We're not going to talk about anything bad ever. Just kind of, people just, they, they need to know that everything's happy all the time. Well, life is, is tragic, and it's tough, and COVID has kind of amp this up in many of our, our lives. <laughs> many people we've seen are struggling with sickness. They're struggling with uncertain financial situations. People are, are struggling with depression. The amount of young people that are struggling with depression right now is astronomical. It continues uh, to rise. And people are struggling because people are dying. People have lost people they love. And I think if many of us were to kind of go to Facebook, and if we were able to maybe uh, do this for our friends and not just maybe significant others, as we think about our relationships kind of in general right now, all of us would click the complicated button, right? Uh, if you, you ever dated at, at one point in time or whatever, or, or have ever done kind of how, you know, if you go to Facebook, you have these categories of your significant others, and you can put like complicated in there. I think that kind of defines probably a lot of our relationships right now. This morning, I want to talk about 
relationships, as we try to re reconnect to the things that are important to us, I want us to think in terms of relationships this morning, because relationships have been a struggle over the past year. If you uh, wanted to date somebody over this past year or get to know somebody in this pa during this past year, I just feel, I feel kind of sorry for you. Like, I don't know how that would even happen or kind of how that would work out. The other day, I just was uh, pulling through kind of my news feed and was reading different articles, and one of the articles that came up was about a husband and wife deciding to get a divorce on whether or not they would wear masks. One wanted the person to wear a mask all the time. The other person re refused to wear it at all, and they have decided to divorce over it. Right? That's, I mean, that's, that's crazy. The, I, we, I might get in trouble for this. I'm just, it's kind of funny. So um, <laughs> we have a name for these. This is another pastor shared this with me. People who are just unwilling to compromise whatsoever on this. Just call them mask holes. All right, if they're willing to ruin relationships over it. Uh, I got a text the other day from a friend I've been trying to, to get uh, kind of a hold of and um, to see. We've been texting back and forth. We'd hoping to maybe see each other after the new year, maybe sit down and have some social distance coffee together or something and chat about life and, and some professional things we have going on. And I sent him a text the other day. He said, hey, how's it going, brother? And here's what he texted me back. I know we haven't chatted much, we actually got COVID over Christmas, and it, it hit all three of us pretty hard, so his wife and his child. My parents had it, how we initially got it, so that was stressful. And now, unrelated, as we are still sort of recovering, my wife's grandparents and mom contracted it, and her grandparents are both in the hospital. So it's been an adventurous few weeks over here. Hope all is well with you guys. End of text. So I, I read through this, and I thought, oh, that's fun. Uh, they had her mom, or had his mom and dad over for Christmas and their entire family and, and a young child got it. And, and you know, everybody has a different view when it comes to COVID and who they want to be around and all those sorts of things. And you kind of even wonder, I, I have no idea about any of this. this is all speculation, but did the parents kind of know they weren't feeling real well and still came over, but just really wanted to see the grandchild. So kind of kept it under wraps. And did they find out about it later? So how happy was the wife that the in-laws brought COVID over? And did she have to miss work because of it? And now her parents and grandparents have it. And thank God, right, that the sound, from the sounds of this text that her parents and her grandparents didn't get it from her in-laws because we know how that would work out. Right, we and this, because I, and I share this with you because this kind of stuff is like happening all over the place, and so it just makes things really difficult. And especially if you think your in-laws are going to kill your grandma and grandpa potentially. And then as I read this text, I think, now should I be meeting with him anytime soon? Uh, you know, will he want to? Oh, what will Emily say? Should I even tell her if I do? Should I have told her if I did? Right? Like, yeah, I mean, it's just everything is super complicated. And, it, and if COVID hasn't complicated your relationships, life will. Right? Think about it. Money will complicate your relationships. It will. It, it, people fight about money all the time. Families fight about money all the time. I, I, I see it. See it all, all the time. It gets, like you could think, like, man, if, if my wife and I, or if my husband and I just had more money, everything would be better. There, there is a point where, like, being somewhat financially comfortable does help your marriage. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but it, this is a really interesting statistic here. Couples that win the lottery are 10 times more likely to get a divorce. Okay? Think money, just money is going to fix your problems, your relationship, right? Politics, I'm not going to get into it. It's just there, right? Not helping. Shame. Shame is something that we all live with and all have. It's, it's, it's right there in Genesis 2 and 3. We all live with shame. We carry around shame. We even shame other people that keeps us from being in real and sincere relationships and fellowship with other people. Many of us, many people, right, we bring in even like sexual shame into marriages. And if people never deal with that, if they never uh, 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 get counseling for that, if, if, if that is never dealt with, it can tear relationships apart. Pride. Pride. Everybody's proud of something. And, and, and pride 
It will keep us from uh, being in the type of relationships that we should be. And when I think of pride, and, and that's kind of exhibited in the Bible and the pride that Jesus calls out, I think about the Pharisees that are looking at uh, other people as they go to pray, and namely this one Pharisee who looks at a tax collector. And by the way, a tax collector here that the Pharisee is looking at, it's a, probably another Jewish tax co collector, but he's collecting taxes from his brothers and sisters, other Jews, for the Romans. So this tax collector is... Is, is basically a traitor here, but he's also a brother of the Pharisee by ethnicity and nationality. And the, the Pharisee, as he goes to pray, he looks at the tax collectors and the others in the room, and he says, I thank God that I'm not like other people. Have, have you ever done that? Or, or maybe other people have done it to you? Uh, I, I thank God I'm not like my parents and friends from back home. I thank God that I was able to go get that college education and just move to a better place, right? Not have to deal with all of that stuff. I thank God that I don't live in that small town anymore. What about this? I thank God that I didn't go to that liberal school that my son or daughter went to. I haven't been brainwashed by them. Thank God that I'm not on government assistance. Thank God I'm not like the wealthy who may have swindled their money or got it unfairly. By the way, who was in on the Robin Hood thing? Anybody? GameStop? Talk to me afterwards. All right. No. All right. Money, pride, politics, shame, all of these things will keep us from having full and flourishing relationships. While we all know, right, the thing that probably makes life the most less tragic are having good relationships. Uh, what I want to tell you this morning is <laughs> that if you want to cut back on the tragedy of life, is you need to get your relationships right. Uh, let me illustrate this uh, really simply here, but what, what the Bible actually considers really to be the most tragic thing in life, right? It's, the, the Bible actually answers this, pro, this, this, uh, this tragedy is that we are all gonna face death. Like that's kind of the ultimate tragedy in the Bible, that we are gonna face death and we are separated from God. And so the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the tragic thing in the Bible is that we lost we, we lost what we had, which was life, eternal life. And it's God trying to get us back into life. And so what he's going to do, he's going to restore his relationship with us so that we can be restored to each other. And we can illustrate this at our death because all of you know this, right? When, 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 when people are, are, are coming into terms with this reality that it, they probably don't have much time left, they're never asking for material things. Like nobody on their, on their, on their uh, uh, deathbed like says, you know what? I, I want to see a statement, like my bank statement. Like nobody, nobody asks for I've never heard of anybody asking for that. Maybe somebody, I'm sure people have. Nobody, nobody's going to ask, hey, can, can, I, can I see the, the, the platform for the Democratic or Republican Party? Right? Nobody's going to ask for that. Nobody's going to ask for a picture of their cars. Why? Because none of those things are of ultimate importance. They're important, but not of ultimate importance. They're going to ask for their family, for their friends. They're not going to ask for their husbands, one husband, maybe, hopefully wife, their children, their grandchildren, they're going to ask for God, they're going to ask for prayer. The end of life right, is always tragic because death is foreign, but it doesn't have to be devastating if you've gotten your relationships right. And here's what I believe. Our faith Christianity makes life less tragic if you believe it and will live it out. It really does. 
as I was preparing for this sermon, I was trying to write down like kind of all the ways that I believe that having faith in Jesus Christ elevates kind of life, like, and makes life less tragic in, in terms of relationship. And I wrote down like probably like seven or eight things, but I'm only going to give you three that I think are the most important for us right now. Three attitudes, maybe three tools that we possess as followers of Jesus to make sure we get our relationships right. And the first is humility. The first is humility. Humility is a lack of arrogance, a modest view of self. So it doesn't say that, oh, I thank God that I'm not like other people. It actually says, like, I am like other people. And as we look at Jesus and as we look at the gospel, what we see in Christ is that we see an ultimate example of humility. Jesus is God who became poor and part of broken humanity. We know Jesus was poor because at least early on in their lives, because when they go to the temple to offer sacrifice, you have an opportunity. If you're somewhat wealthy or kind of in a higher class, you offer a lamb because that's what you have. If not, you offer either a turtle dove um, or another type of bird, and that's what they did. And so we see that Jesus starts out by very humble means. Paul describes Jesus' humility this way, and he tells us we must have the same attitude in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. He says, you must have this same attitude. You need to hold on to that. You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had, though he was in the form of God, or though he was God. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took on the humble position of a slave. Now, we are free from, we are, we are free from sin. Right? Uh, we, are, uh, uh, we are free from the world, but we are not free from being servants of God. You either be a slave to sin, you'll either be a slave to the world, or you'll be a slave to God. And it's better to be a slave to God and a servant of God. And he was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death, death on a cross. So what we see here is that Jesus died or, or humbles himself by becoming a human. How does he humble himself? How does he show his humbleness before God? Well, he obeys God, but then he goes and he does something that is completely undignified, which is dies a criminal's death on a cross. We have crosses that are displayed all throughout this church. But what's crazy about that is that is not, that is not like a dignified symbol in the Roman world. Rather, it's a very humiliating way to die. Jesus humbled himself by becoming a human. That's how he showed his humility. And then he died on the cross and was humiliated in front of the world. Therefore, God has elevated him to the highest place of honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what we see here is that in Jesus' humbleness and his humiliation that is how he receives his exaltation it's how we receive our salvation jesus's mission to restore his relationship with us meant meant that it could not happen without humility or what it shows us is that that's this relationship that he has restored with us could not happen without jesus displaying humility and when we think about this, what we need to realize is that if Jesus had to be humble so that we could be restored to God, if we think we can have good relationships with God or with anybody else without having this same attitude, we are lying to ourselves. We are wrong. We too have to be humble. If you want to know how to fix relationships, it starts with you and it starts with your humility. You probably aren't going to have to die on the cross, but you are going to have to kill your pride. So what does this look like? Well, for many of you, what this looks like is, what, is that you are going to have to take initiative. I didn't put that down in your notes, but you might want to write this down in your notes. If you are struggling in a relationship with somebody that you know needs to be reconciled, that you know needs to be restored, that you know you need to reach out to, is that you need to take the initiative. Jesus took the initiative with us. Well, well, well Josh, they did me wrong. It was their fault. They, they sinned against me. They dishonored me. They, they said something bad about me. They did something to me. This is why I love Romans 5.8. 
Romans 5, 8 says that God, love, or God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It doesn't say that hey, we, were, we were down here, that God's people were repenting, they were crying out to God, they were telling God that they needed forgiveness, that they are, <laughs> are, are sorry for their sins. No, no, no. It, it says while we were still sinners, while we were still sinning, while we were still stuck in our sin. God reaches out. Jesus took the initiative. Jesus became human. It's the incarnation there is Jesus taking initiative. This is why Jesus can teach in Matthew 15 and 17 this to us. It says, if a believer sins. And so here, by the way, so this is obviously written to the church here. I think like even if you're not a Christian, these principles that I want to share with you this morning are really helpful for, for you if you're struggling with your family, if you're a believer, if, if another believer. Because here, we, we, we probably don't do this. I know like the modern church doesn't do this as well. The early church saw itself as a family. They did. They, 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 they saw themselves as a family. So these are brothers and sisters. These are people who are there for each other. They love each other. Like they can't, they're not allowed not to care for one another in the context of the Bible. Just like some of you would think about in your own families here. So if another believer sins against you, go. See that? If somebody sins against you, what's your job to do? Go. And go privately and point out the offense. Go privately. That means don't go to Facebook and talk about how they wronged you first. Right? <laughs> A bad idea. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. Now, something to think about here, what that tells us here is that people in the context of the church will actually be humble enough or should be humble enough to listen and be willing enough to confess if they've done something wrong, said something they shouldn't have or done uh, something to somebody or to you particularly that they should not have done. So there's a level of humility there. But if you are unsuccessful, now that's interesting. <laughs> Jesus just assumes like this might not work. <laughs> So what are you going to do next? If you are unsuccessful, take two or three others with you, or, or one or two others with you, and what's that word again? Go. So if it doesn't work the first time, try a second time. This time, take a few others with you. Maybe in the context, again, if you're watching this, you're not a, a, a believer, and you don't have people in the church that you feel like you can trust, or this other person that would trust, get to a counselor. Get to a mediator. And go back again. So you're taking initiative now a second time so that everything you say might be confirmed by two or three witnesses. So trying to get some uh, people involved here. If the person still refuses to listen, so that other thing might not work, right? <laughs> Take your case to the church. So go again, talk to bigger people. This is why it's nice to maybe have a, a church body where we can convince people, hey, you've, you've done wrong. Hey, let's, let's restore this relationship here, then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that church, treat that person as a pagan or tax collector. So in verse 17, basically what you've done is at this point, you're like, you're trying everything. You're bringing everyone out, right? This is a, this is a full, like you're, you are organizing here, like full intervention. You're bringing an A and E in and everything. And you're sitting down with these people. I don't actually recommend doing that. I don't know why they do that. Like bring camera crews in to, to like, work things out. It doesn't seem like a good idea. But they're trying everything is the point here. It, it, is that Jesus says you, the offended, needs to go to the offender and you have to, you, that's your responsibility. The initiation, it, it's, it's on you. It's not on your brother. It's not on your sister. It's not on your mom. It's not on your dad. It's not on your friend. It lies with you. And then it goes on, though, if it's finally just not successful. It's this idea of treating somebody like a tax collector or pagan. Well, what does that mean? Well, in human relationships, it does take humility on both ends for a relationship to be completely restored. Real and deep friendships and relationships won't work if one person really has wronged another person and the other person is unwilling to ask for forgiveness. It's not that, it's not that Jesus... It doesn't leave room for a tax collector or pagans to be his friends or his followers. In fact, he, he said the, he does the exact opposite. The writer of this, by the way, Matthew, was a tax collector that was a follower 
of Jesus. What Jesus is talking about here, and his point is really simple for all of us to understand, is that deep and true fellowship is broken if both parties are not willing to act in humility. Now, this leads us to this next attitude um, or tool that we have to restore relationships, which is forgiveness. The goal, by the way, of taking initiative, of going to somebody and saying that you have been wrong or offended or whatever that might be, actually is not to get the other person to say they've wronged or offended you. The goal is not confession, but it's restoration. It's to forgive and release them of wrongdoing so that you can heal. And Christians must forgive. We have to forgive. It's it's really the only option that we're given in certain relationships. Now, here's I know what some of you are thinking, right? You're playing you're playing like all these scenarios in your head, uh, and some of you have been deeply wronged by people. So there's all these scenarios. Well, I, do I have to forgive in this scenario? Do I have to forgive in this scenario? And the people listening to Jesus was were doing the same. Right? Peter had to have been doing the same. Here's why. Let's continue here in Matthew 18. It says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Jesus responds, No, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Now this is obviously a figure of speech here. Jesus is just saying, you, like, you just got to keep forgiving. But even if it's not, that person gets 490 chances. If you don't like figures of speech, there you go. That's a lot of chances that you're giving somebody. Continuing here, then Jesus is going to tell a a story or parable here. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his his accounts up to date with his servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. But his master, then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left, the king went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. The fellow, his fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more. Be patient with me, and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. The king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid the entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. The point Jesus is making here when it comes to forgiveness is that so many of us Ask from Jesus what we are unwilling to give to others. And what's extremely convicting and even scary here is that if you're not willing to do it for others, especially other brothers and sisters in Christ, you will be responsible for earning your own forgiveness and paying your own debt back to God. Which is nothing any of us can afford to do. I'm always struck by the story of Joseph and the Bible. Uh, those of you uh, who know the story of Joseph and the Bible, uh, you know that Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Uh, and maybe I'm always struck by it because I'm a brother, I have two brothers, but unfortunately, not unfortunately, fortunately, I'm the oldest brother, so I'd have been the one doing the selling. And you would think sometimes that I had sold them into slavery. (laughs) 
But Joseph is sold into slavery, and he spends years in slavery, in and out of prison, and thankfully, God was faithful to him, and he continued to trust in God, and he rose to the top, and there was a famine in the land, and his brothers eventually have to come to him, and they need help. And what does Joseph do? He, he helps them. Now, Joseph could have had them killed. Joseph could have had them tortured. He could have had them thrown into jail. Or Joseph could have just simply said, hey, I'm not going to help you. I, I can't forgive you. Just get out of here. I don't ever want to see you again. But we get to the end of the story, and his, his brothers are actually scared because they figured, well, maybe Joseph has only been nice to us up to this point because our dad was still alive, and he wanted to see our dad, and we, he knew we were the ticket to his fa- get him getting back to his father and seeing his father again. And so they're kind of talking, and they're like, should we trust Joseph? What should we do? And here is what Joseph says to them. He says to them, in Genesis 50, 19 through 20, he says, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus, he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Would you do that if your brother or sister did that to you? He had every right to hate. He had every right to want nothing to do with them. Instead, he chose to trust in God's gracious and forgiving attitude. And it's this attitude that actually unites his family or brought his family together. It's what kept his family together. As I was reflecting this on this in this past week, it's just reminded me, I want to have that attitude. I want to have that kind of attitude that is gracious, that is forgiving. Because I I want my other family members to have that attitude towards me when I do act like the oldest brother or the older brothers here. When I do wrong, I want them ready to forgive me. Joseph had to forgive them to save them. Bitterness and forgiveness will destroy important relationships. It will and it does. That's why God has given us the ability to forgive and that's why he's forgiven us. The third and final attitude that we have and tool that we have to restore relationships is hope. Hope is believing in a better future that you cannot or do not see. Christians are full of hope. We are full of hope. Romans 8, 24 through 25 says it this way, we were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. So there are relationships that we don't quite have or aren't quite restored, but that we hope will be and can be. And why? Well, one of the reasons why is we believe that people can change. We believe that God can change people. We believe even maybe even the tragedy of life can change people. You all probably have experienced that. Sometimes life humbles you, and that is probably God at work trying to humble you so that God's kindness can lead to repentance so that people can change, so that you can change. I was talking to a a man who spent several years in a federal prison recently, and he was talking to me about just kind of some of his philosophy classes or whatever it might be, and um, how uh, uh, a lot of his professors at the time didn't believe in in, in God. And um, this was after he got out of federal prison, and he just said, like, that's ludicrous to tell prisoners. (laughs) That's all we got. He says, God, all we've got is hope that God will forgive us and that God can restore us and that society will welcome us back because we can, we can change and that, that people will allow us to kind of move on with our lives after we've kind of paid our debt to society. He said, hope is necessary for them. Hope is necessary for him. Even now, as he continues to work and provide for his family, he said, God is what I, <laughs> without God, he said, that, that's what I've got. Hope is necessary for all of us. It's necessary for you. It's necessary for me. And our ultimate hope is believing that our most important relationship has been settled. We have been set right 
and we have been reconciled with God. Why? Because God humbly came. He died on the cross. He has forgiven us so that we might have hope. We have not seen the new heaven. We have not seen the new earth. But we believe that there will come a time of no more death, no more sickness, no more suffering. There will be no more broken relationships. Tragedy will not take place anymore. We believe that 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 time is coming. And because we have this hope, because we have this promise, we are called and we are sent to live lives of reconciliation. The reconciled will reconcile. This is why we will work to set relationships right. If we want to make the world a less tragic place, the church has got to get this right. If you want to make your life less tragic and more beautiful, get this right. If you're not sure, I guess, even how to think about this or even how this works, this is maybe the best way I can explain this. I'm going to end with this. Think about the worst thing you've ever done. Think about a time where you have showed the least amount of humility in your life. A time when you've done something that should never be forgiven. A time when you've been at your worst. God, through Christ, proclaims that all who repent, all who recognize their wrong and have a desire to turn from it and trust in Christ, are forgiven through the humble work of Christ on the cross. Jesus Christ does not count any of that against you. You've been forgiven. If you truly believe deep down that you've been offered this forgiveness at your worst, God transforms your life in a way that you will give that forgiveness, you will offer that forgiveness to others. It will humble you. It will make you the type of person who desires to initiate an opportunity to forgive and restore and heal broken relationships. It'll remind you that if God can bring you to repentance and put you in right relationship with him, if he can save you, if he can change you, he can do it for others. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you give us all the same attitude as Christ. One of humility, forgiveness, and hope. Bring to mind people in our lives and whom we need to reconcile with. And remind us that we have the tools that we need to pursue reconciliation. Remind us that this is the ministry that you have given us. And that is good for us and it's good for others. So help us not to reject this. We thank you for not rejecting us or giving up on us because of your great and gracious character. And so God, we ask you for the same attitude as Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his holy, good, precious, and powerful name. Amen.